Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Londa and the organizers uh, for inviting me here uh, to speak to you today at this very interesting meeting in this uh, lovely city. Um, I want to uh, tell you about a particular type of sexism that uh, persists in biomedicine, uh, and I'm going to use uh, as in my example uh, the field of pain because that's what I study. Um, so pain is interesting because um, the issue of sex differences in, in pain are actually something that people have an opinion on. Um, you go and ask people on the street who's more sensitive to pain, men or women, uh, and people will guess, and they're often very confident of their guess. Um, a lot of times uh, they guess that uh, women are less sensitive or more tolerant of pain than men are, uh, and if you ask them for their reasoning, they'll give you uh, a reasoning that goes along with this old uh, joke here. Um, what we do know is this. Um, we know that uh, pain is more prevalent uh, in women than men. This is uh, beyond question at this point. Um, it all stems from this uh, table in a very influential paper uh, back in 1997, uh, where Karen Berkeley simply made a list of all known painful disorders, and she put them into three columns, uh, one where the particular disorder was more prevalent in women than men, uh, one where the disorder was more prevalent in men than women, and one where there was no obvious sex prevalence. You can see, of course, that the female list is a lot longer than the male list, but it is also the case that the painful disorders on that list are more prevalent overall than the disorders on the male list, and so people have estimated that up to 70% of chronic pain patients are, in fact, women. Now, that might be because women are more sensitive to pain. But of course, it doesn't have to be, because another reasonable explanation of this is simply that women are more likely to go to the doctor, or more accurately, that men are less likely to go to the doctor, yes? And if you don't go to the doctor, you can't become a chronic pain patient. So the way to figure this out is to do epidemiological studies uh, through uh, telephone surveys or questionnaires. Um, and these have been done many, many times, and I've summarized the evidence here. Um, regardless of what the prevalence of the pain is, um, and you can see across different types of pain, if you simply subtract the prevalence in men from the prevalence in women, you can see that across the board, with only one exception, uh, female uh, women are more likely to endorse the idea that yes, they have chronic pain than men uh, by approximately 5 to 10 percent across the board. Now again, this might be because women are more sensitive to pain, but it doesn't have to be. The only way to know for sure is to do carefully controlled laboratory experiments where you bring men and women into a laboratory and you give them very precisely calibrated noxious stimuli and then you measure their responses. And this, of course, has been done hundreds and hundreds of times as well. Um, and I believe we have now arrived at a consensus in the scientific literature. This consensus took a long time to arrive at. Um, but it is clearly the case uh, that, on average, uh, women are, in fact, more sensitive uh, and less tolerant of pain than men. It's not a big difference. Uh, it doesn't show up in every single study. Um, but when the difference is found, it always goes in this direction. So, if women are the vast majority of chronic pain patients, and it can be demonstrated conclusively that women are more sensitive to pain, uh, to pain than men, you would imagine that in the basic science studies, um, which of course are performed overwhelmingly uh, in recent decades uh, in rats and mice, um, you would imagine that we would be using female rats and female mice to perform this research so that the research would be relevant to the needs of the vast majority of the patients in whose name we're doing this research. Um, but of course you would be wrong. Um, the vast majority of the subjects of basic science studies of pain uh, are male rats and male mice. This review was performed in 2005 uh, and covered the 10-year period before that, um, but I've looked at the literature more recently and absolutely nothing has changed. It still remains the case that the overwhelming choice for subjects of these experiments are male rodents. Um, and in fact, this is not simply uh, something about pain. This is true across biomedicine. Uh, so Irv Zucker published a review in 2010 where he showed that across a number of fields, um, the percentage of studies using only male subjects in blue, 
uh, was generally a lot greater than the percentage of studies using only females in red, with the obvious exception of reproductive studies. Um, you can see that in the hard studies, on the hard science studies on the left, um, there is uh, very few studies using both sexes and a shockingly large number of studies where the sex of the subject isn't even reported at all. Um, now, I think this is a scandal. I think this is simply unethical. Um, and the question then arises, why does it persist? Now, for a long time, I think the reason was that scientists felt that this wasn't an appropriate topic of study. Um, in 1992, I was a graduate student, and I found a sex difference. And the postdoctoral fellow who trained me said this actual quote, sex differences are to be enjoyed, not to be studied. He was only half joking. Um, he felt the same way, by the way, about alcohol research of interest. Um, it simply didn't strike him as something that I should spend any more time on. Fortunately for my career, I didn't listen to him. Um, I think the real reason, though, um, why scientists continue to use exclusively male subjects um, is that there is an expectation that because of circulating hormone levels in rodents, um, and of course, rats and mice have estrous cycles that are uh, uh, somewhat parallel to human menstrual cycles. There's an expectation that because of this circulating hormones and, and their circulating levels, um, that data that you would obtain in experiments using female rodents would be more variable than data obtained using male rodents. This strikes me actually as a perfectly reasonable expectation. There's only one problem with it, which is that is it em it's empirically false. So we have shown for pain on the left, um, and Herb Zerker's group uh, in a, a, a very important paper published last year has shown across biomedicine that in fact female mice are not more variable. Uh, the data you get from them are not more variable than data from males. In fact, if anything, it's the other way around. It's the data from male mice that are more variable than data from female mice. Why might that be? No one's actually proven this, but I have a hypothesis, and it involves the fact that male rodents have a source of variability that female rodents don't have, which is that they have dominance hierarchies in their cages, and they fight each other. And how close your experiment is to the last time there was a fight, I believe, is actually causing more variability than circulating hormone levels in female mice, which, of course, don't fight at all. OK, so what? Um, you could argue that unless one can show that there are important differences in the biology of pain between male and female rodents, that it really doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, and I would actually partially agree with that, but I want to um, uh, point everyone's attention to the fact that there are, in fact, two different kinds of sex differences. The more common one is a quantitative sex difference, as shown here. So you dip uh, the tail of a mouse into hot water, and you measure the amount of time it takes for it to withdraw its tail. And it turns out that females do this a little bit faster than males do. And that's all fine and good, um, but it's not particularly important. Here, on the other hand, is a qualitative sex difference, which is dramatically important. So what you're looking at here is the ability of a drug called dextromethorphan to potentiate, to add to the pain inhibition or analgesia produced by morphine, which you've all heard of. And you can find that finding in the literature in about 100 papers. Okay, These are our data, but this very same finding uh, can be found in 100 papers in the scientific literature. It will not surprise any of you to hear that of those 100 papers, 99 of them were performed in male rats and mice. If you do the same experiment again, but you use female mice, you get this. No potentiation at all. It doesn't depend on the dose of morphine. It doesn't depend on the dose of dextromethorphan. There simply is no interaction between these two drugs in female mice. So now you're saying to yourself, OK, fine, that's mice. But these sorts of things, if they were known before 2004, would have tremendous real world implications. What I'm showing you here are the trial results of a drug called Morphidex, which was a one-to-one -one combination of morphine and dextromethorphan 
in humans, and what you might be able to see is that the two lines basically overlap each other. This clinical trial failed utterly. It was not the case that Morphidex produced better pain relief in humans than morphine. Now, do I know that the reason for this trial failure is because of sex differences? No. Of course, clinical trials by law are run in men and women. I called up the drug company in question and I said, we have a sex difference in our mice. Is there a sex difference in your clinical data? They said, we don't know. We never looked. I said, well, for God's sake, man, look. And ultimately, they came back to me in a week and said, no, we can't. The lawyers won't let us reopen the data. So we will never know whether Morphidex failed because of sex differences, but I submit to you that if it had been known uh, that there was a sex difference in the biology here, this clinical trial would have been run very, very differently, if at all, and the drug company in question would have saved themselves tens of millions of dollars. I now believe that these sorts of things represent the tip of the iceberg in pain and possibly wider across biomedicine. I want to tell you a little story about what's going on in the spinal cord, uh, which turns out to be the nexus, the very center of pain processing, where information comes up from the periphery to the brain and also from the brain down to the spinal cord to try to modulate that information. And we've learned a lot about uh, the relevant biology in the spinal cord. Don't worry, I'm not going to walk you through this figure. I just want to point out that until about 20 years ago, all the biology, uh, all the study of pain processing in the spinal cord focused on the green cells, which are the neurons. In the last 20 years, we've come to realize that there are important contributions from other cells in the spinal cord, including astrocytes on the right, but most importantly, a cell called microglia on the left. There are now hundreds and hundreds of studies implicating microglia in the biology of pain processing in the spinal cord. We now believe that the entire microglial contribution to pain processing is male specific and the reason no one noticed this before is because virtually every single study in this literature, hundreds and hundreds of studies, have been done on male mice and rats. Um, the data uh, in our study which we just published look essentially like this. We give an injury to animals, this causes increased pain sensitivity, and then we give some sort of drug that blocks microglia. And as you can see, the blue data, that drug dose-dependently normalizes the pain sensitivity of mice, where those same drugs at the same doses don't do anything in female mice. Uh, and ultimately, we've come up with an entire alternative biological pathway where we now believe that male mice are using microglia to process pain and female mice having the same amount of pain, uh, that their pain processing actually occurs uh, using another type of immune cell called a T cell. Now we believe this is actually um, possibly unprecedented in biomedicine. There are a lot of known examples of sex differences in genetics and sex differences in physiology. We believe this is the first example where a non-reproductive biological phenomenon has been shown to be dependent on one cell in one sex and a completely different cell uh, in another sex. Um, but again, I don't think this would surprise the immunologists very much. I think there are sex differences like this to be found all over biomedicine if we would only look. Of course, the implications of this are obvious. If, in fact, completely different biological circuits are being used to process pain in males versus females, that implies that one could develop drugs, analgesics, that actually work in women and not men or men and not women, uh, this, of course, would be a first in biomedicine. There's no known examples of this, but again, I think we might be seeing this coming down the line in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and I would suggest that it will happen in pain probably before any other uh, disease state, but we'll see about that. Um, 
Okay, so the solution to this problem is obvious. It's obvious to me. Everyone should be doing all biological research at the preclinical level in both males and females. Uh, you've been told earlier today that there are governmental organizations around the world that are trying to institute such policies. Uh, here's an example of the, uh, uh, the recently announced NIH policy. Um, to me, what is critical here um, is the um, uh, methods that are used to try to get us to a situation where everyone is now doing their experiments on both uh, uh, sexes of animals. And of course, the two ways that one could ensure this uh, would either be to give incentives uh, or to give penalties for failing to uh, uh, change. Um, I actually have clear preferences among these two, and it might be interesting in the discussion section uh, of this uh, plenary to see uh, what you think uh, about the relative merits of these approaches. Um, so with that, I want to thank uh, the folks in my laboratory that uh, do the work uh, and my funding agencies, and thank you very much for your attention. So thanks.